So today we're going to begin the process of graphing polynomial functions of higher degrees. We've already graphed linear, um, which is we've graphed um, linear functions, which are uh, functions where we have, you know, um, an x to the first power. Okay. We've graphed quadratic functions where we have, for example, maybe um, plus 2x plus 4, or something that looks like that, and you've learned to graph that, okay? Now we're going to get polynomials of higher degrees, like um, we're going to get, um, you know, uh, cubic functions, quartic functions, quintic functions, functions where the, where the exponent is going to be 3, 4, or 5, where the terms are going to be multiple terms, 4, 5, 6 terms. And so we have to start learning how do we graph that. So again, when we go to graph it, we have to consider what the end behavior of the function is going to look like. So if you noticed in the linear function that I wrote on the page before, we had a 3x, you know, plus 2, let's I forget what I wrote. But again, you know that this is a line and this, you know, the slope is positive. So you know that um, your line sort of goes like that. So when we talk about end behavior, we sort of take the middle out and we say whatever happens in the middle okay we know that the left side of this graph is going to go down and the right side is going to go up or if i give you a quadratic and i say you know uh, 3x squared plus 2x plus 5 um, i know that this is a quadratic that's going to open upward and i know it's going to be something u-shaped right i don't know where the middle is going to go i don't know how wide it is but I know that the ends of my graph are going to go up on the left and up on the right. And so there's a reason why they do that. We don't know about the middle. The middle is kind of like a question mark, okay? But we know what the ends are going to do. And the reason we know what the ends are going to do is because there's a pattern to end behavior. So the first thing is, if the polynomial is an odd degree, okay, meaning like the linear one where the exponent okay, that means the exponent of that leading term, if it's odd, okay, that means the, um, the end behavior is going to be opposite each other. They're going to be different, okay? So you're going to have opposite behavior at each end. So like this linear function, if you sort of think about it, the right side is going upwards, the left side is going down. So when one side goes down, the other goes up. They go in opposite directions, Okay. Now you might say, well, how do you know the right goes up and the left goes down and all that? Well, that's determined by the a value. Okay. That's determined by the value of a. Now a is the number in front of the leading term. Okay. So in an odd function, like a linear function or a cubic function, if a is positive, the left is going to go down and the right is going to rise or go up, okay? Like this one. Notice the left side's going down and the right side's going up. If the A value happens to be negative, okay, then the opposite occurs. The left is going to go up and the right is going to go down, okay? So in a linear function, it would go like that, okay? The left side would be up and the right side would be down. Just think of, again, a line with a negative slope. You know it goes down from left to right. So again, think of linear function when you think of odd functions and kind of think about what happens with the ends. Now, in an even degree polynomial, what that means, again, is that the exponent of the first term is even. So that's like a quadratic. That's like what I drew up here. This is an even, okay? So this one's odd and this one's even. Okay, and in an even one, what's interesting is that the ends go in the same direction. So the ends are going to go both up or both down. Now, what determines that? Again, the A value. If A is positive, both ends are going to go up. So it's going to go up on left and up on right. And we've talked about that. Where quadratics, you know that if A is positive, it opens upward. And if A happens to be negative it's going to open downward. So both ends are going to go down. Okay, so again, you need to know odd, opposite directions, even, same directions, and then the A value is going to tell you. And again, I would use a basic quadratic and a basic linear function because they're perfect examples of odds and evens. 
So the next thing we have to consider when we go to graphing is we know what happens to the ends, but now we have to figure out the middles, right? What's the middles going to look like? We have to figure out um, other points on the graph that are important. So the zeros, which we also know as the roots or the solutions, or again, the x-intercepts, right? The real roots come off as x-intercepts of the graph. So we definitely want to find all those. Um, we want to factor. We want to find all our zeros, and the real ones are our x-intercepts, okay? And then we also want to determine the multiplicity. So this is where we want to see if a solution shows up more than one time. And you might say, well, why do we care how many times uh, a solution or a root shows up? Well, if a root shows up more than once, okay, we need to see how many times it shows up. If it occurs an even amount of times, then in the graph, okay, when we're graphing, um, and, and we know that point is going to be on the x-axis, but the curve or the graph is going to bounce off of the point. It's going to turn at the point. You're going to have what's known as a bounce. So let's just say that I have a graph, and um, this is, let's say, 1. And let's say that one has a multiplicity that it shows up two times, okay? When my graph, let's say it goes like this, approaches the one, if it shows up an even number of times, my graph will bounce and go back and down again. It's not going to go through it, okay? But if my solution or my zero or my root occurs an odd number of times, then the graph is going to go through it. Okay, so what happens is in this previous example, I'll show you now I'm going to do it in red. If I'm, or here, let me do it in red. If I'm approaching the, the point and it shows up an odd number of times, I'm going to go through the point to the other side of the graph. So again, if something occurs more than once, I'm going to, if it happens an even number of times, I'm going to bounce off of it. If it happens an odd number of times, um, one time, three time, five times, I'm going to go through it. Okay, so again, let's try to do some problems and then, it, you know, it's always easier when we actually try to do it. So we're going to look here and it says we want to find the end behavior, the zeros of this polynomial, and the multiplicity. So they're not really asking us to graph this. So luckily for us, this is a four-term polynomial and I always consider a um, uh, you know, obviously factoring by grouping. And in this case, I'm lucky because I can. I noticed that this is something that would work. If I factored by grouping, I would get x squared um, minus 4 and x plus 2 as my factors, and I could keep going. This is x minus 2, x plus 2, and x plus 2. So Again, now I'm going to find my zeros. I recognize, obviously, that x plus 2 shows up twice. So I know that the solution x equals negative 2 has a multiplicity of 2. It's going to occur two times. So technically, when I go to graph this, guys, I know my graph is going to cross at positive 2 or touch 2. My intercepts are going to be 2 and negative 2. And when I go to graph it, um, now I know that when I'm talking about negative 2, I'm going to have to bounce there. And when I'm talking about positive 2, since it only shows up once, I'm going to go through it. And again, we'll talk about that when we get to graphing, but that's where the um, zeros matter and that's where multiplicity comes into play. So I've taken into account my zeros and my multiplicity with the whole through and bounce thing. Now I have to consider my end behavior. Well, for my end behavior, I'm going to look at the leading term. Basically, this is 1x cubed. So I know that the cubed means my ends are going to go in opposite direction. And you might say, well, in what direction? Well, I have to look at the a value. And in this case, a equals 1, which is positive. So that means my left side is going to go down, my left end, and my right end is going to go up. And so that's my end behavior. 
So these three things, n behavior, zeros, and multiplicity, is all we're asking for in this problem. Now we're going to go to the next problem, and we're going to actually use it. Okay, we're going to work with it. So again, strategies for graphing, determine end behavior, find your zeros and your multiplicity. When we go to graph, we're going to want to include the y-intercept. And then in between those points, we're going to probably want to plot a few additional points. And I'll show you how to do it and why we do it. So in this question here, number two, it's asking us to graph this function. Notice this polynomial. Whoa. Okay, and it wants you to graph it using what you learned in this section. So what you've learned about this section is how the zeros are the x-intercepts, right? So you've got that, or the real zeros anyway, right? The real number zeros are the x-intercepts. You also learned about end behavior. So you learned how the graph should end, and you learned about multiplicity which again, multiplicity will determine whether the graph will go through a point or if it'll bounce off of the point. Um, and so, first of all, to be able to even start this process, we're gonna have to factor the polynomial that's been given to us. Now, this particular polynomial is not one that I have skills to factor um, using grouping um, because it doesn't work. Like if you do it, you're gonna see you can't get the numbers in the parentheses or the expressions to match. So you're gonna have to utilize the strategy that we talked about, about trying to identify some zeros, okay? Trying to find that first factor in the effort to shrink this down. So the coefficients of the A value here is just plus minus one. The coefficients of the uh, last value here is one, two, three, and six. Um, not the coefficients, the factors of that, right? So the factors of the first term is plus or minus one, factor of the last term is plus minus one, two, three, six. And if I'm gonna create the fractions, remember it's the last number over the first number, so I know that my possible um, zeros, okay, or roots, however you wanna call it, is gonna be one plus minus one over one, plus minus two over one, plus minus three over one, and plus minus six over one. So it's these eight numbers. So I'm gonna set up a synthetic division problem, and I'm gonna do trial and error until I find my values. So when I look at my equation, I know there's a one x cubed, a minus two x squared, a minus five x, and a plus six. Nothing's missing, and placeholders are not necessary in this problem. And I'm gonna start again with my first number, I get minus one, minus one, minus six, minus six, and zero. And I realize that x equals one is an actual solution. So again, my zeros, right? I know that x equals one. Um, as a factor, x equals one is represented by the factor of x minus one. So that's one factor. And these three numbers here are going to translate to a new factor. And it's I started with cubed, so I'm going to go to squared. And it's going to be x squared minus x minus 6. And so now, again, the purpose of this process um, to find a factor is to take this original polynomial and bring it down one degree. So I go from an x cubed to an x squared. And usually, at that point, I'm able to factor it, and I am. I know that x squared minus x minus 6 is factored as x minus 3 and x plus 2. And so these are my three factors. From those three factors, I'm going to make them equal to 0, and I'm going to get my zeros. So x minus 1, x equals 1. x minus 3, x equals 3 and x plus two, x equals negative two. So now I have my zeros, okay? And I can think of these as ordered pairs, one zero, three zero, and negative two zero. And remember that our zeros are, our real zeros anyway, are our x-intercepts, right? So I know that my graph is gonna cross at one zero, it's gonna cross at three zero, and it's gonna cross at negative two zero. So I basically have some pretty important 
pieces of information here, okay? So now I have identified my x-intercepts or my real zeros. I um, now need to start to consider other factors, right? So um, one additional thing that you're going to want to find that we haven't really talked about and it wasn't listed is the y-intercept. You're going to want to know the value of the y-intercept because, again, it's always important that your intercepts are accurate. And so if I go back to the original graph and I consider plugging in zero for x, when I do that, notice that all my terms are going to cancel and I'm going to be left with 6. That means my y-intercept, when x is 0, y is 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So here's my y-intercept right there. Okay, And so again, that's another really important point. So now let's sketch uh, what the graph um, might look like, right? So what you notice is, let's start with end behavior, okay? So end behavior, I'm going to go to my leading term. My leading term is 1x cubed. And so again, cubed means that um, my ends are going to go in opposite directions, okay? And because the a value is 1, so a is positive, Right, and when A is positive, it means left down, right up, okay? So just in a very rudimentary way, that means that the right side of my graph is gonna go upwards and the left side of my graph is gonna go downward. And so where do, why did I start at those ends? Because I'm gonna start at the leftmost intercept and that's where I'm gonna do whatever the left side does and I'm going to go to the rightmost intercept, and I'm going to do whatever the right side does from there. So I know it's going to go like that. Now what I have to try to figure out is the middle of this thing, right? So the multiplicity is going to help me with that as well. So if you noticed, all of these values showed up just one time each. When the multiplicity is odd, so one time is odd, that means that I'm going to go through all points, okay, or all intercepts. So I'm going to go through this one, I'm going to go through this one, and I'm going to go through this one. And so again, how did this work? We're going to do like a little wave. Basically, we're going to go from here through that intercept. We're going to go up to the y-intercept. We're going to kind of roll back down. We're going to go through this one. At some point, we're going to spin around, we're gonna go up and go through it again. And notice that that's kind of a just a general sketch of my wave. Now, if I really wanna be accurate, okay, I'm going to sort of have to figure out um, a better guess of like what is gonna be the y value when x is negative one, or what's the y value when x is two. Because again, those points are in between the intercepts, and if I plug them in, I'm going to get a more accurate drawing. So now somebody you know, said to me um, earlier, does that mean I have to plug it into the original equation? And yeah, that's usually what you do, right? You come to the equation here and you plug in um, you know, two for x or whatever for x and you get your values. However, remember that we recently just learned how to use synthetic division to find the value of a function. So I'm going to kind of rewrite it. So remember, it's 1x cubed, negative 2x squared, minus 5x, and 6. So if I want to find out the value of this function when x is negative 1, I could just plug it into here. So minus 3, 3, minus 2, 2, 8. So when x is negative 1, y is positive 8. So I'm going to come back to my graph, and I'm kind of going to get rid of this that I did, this middle and I'm gonna do the middle a little bit better, okay? So I still have my intercepts, that didn't change. My three X intercepts, I have my Y intercept, but now when X is one, negative one, Y is eight. So that's up here. So notice that's a little bit different than what I had planned. And then let's try when X is two. So let's come back over here and let's try what is the value of the function when x is positive 2. So again, we've got 2, 0, 0, minus 5, minus 10, and minus 4. So when x is 2, 
y is negative 4. So again, 1, 2, 3, 4. No, not there. Sorry. 2, negative 4 is right here. 1, 2, 3, 4. And so now that's pretty good. Now look what happens. So now when I go to sketch it, and I'm going to actually sketch the whole thing at one time so it's a nice consistent wave. Now I'm going to do it here. So I know that my graph is going to go like that. It's going to get to there. It's going to go through the y-intercept. It's going to go through this intercept, through this point, back up through the intercept, and back up. And so it's a wave that looks something like this. Now this is a little bit more accurate graph than my original, okay? And so, but again, we start out with our critical points. We start out with our x-intercepts. We learn whether the graph is gonna go through those. We always go through our y-intercept. And then we might add a couple of extra points just to make sure that our peaks are high enough and our valleys or our lows are low enough. And that's it. And so now you just completed your first graph. Again, we're gonna come over here. We're gonna get another problem, right? We've got problem number three. We have a whole bunch of them that we're gonna do. So again, when I look at this, of course I'm gonna to try to factor this like normal to solve it, but I can't. So I know I'm gonna to have to set this up as synthetic and use guessing and checking. So my factors of the first coefficient is plus minus one and two. My last one is plus minus one, two, three, four. Then I've got um, two times six and one times 12. So it's all those numbers. And so when I'm coming up with my possible roots, right, um, or possible zeros, I've got to put all of these over these two. So I'm going to start putting everything over one. Well, you know anything over one is just itself. So I'm going to start with just rewriting these numbers by themselves. And then the second set is gonna be those numbers over two. So it's gonna be um, one over two, two over two, three over two, four over two, uh, six over two, and 12 over two. Now what happens is, if you think about it, two over two is one, and I've already accounted for one up there. Uh, 4 over 2 is 2, which I've already accounted for in the top one. 6 over 2 is 3, which I already have. And 12 over 2 is 6, which I already have. So what's left over is there. So those are my possible numbers that I'm going to use for synthetic division. When I go to my problem, I'm going to start looking. I got 2x cubed minus 1x squared minus 25x and minus 12. Nothing's missing, no placeholders are needed, and I can start guessing and checking. So I'm going to start with 1, and I do the math. It's just a positive 1, 1, minus 24. And notice, I know this is not going to end in anything, so 1 doesn't work. Um, if I do negative 1, I don't think that one works either. Um, so I do minus 2, minus 3, plus 3, minus 22, and that isn't going to work. So the ones are out. They, they're not working. So done with that. Then I go to 2s, right? So I'm going to do negative 2. For some reason, I feel like negative 2 is it. Negative 4. That's negative 5. That gets me to 10. That's minus 15. And no, that doesn't work either. So minus 2 is out. Positive 2, let's try that one, that's 2, that's 4, that's 3, that's 6, that's negative 19, and that isn't going to do anything either. So positive and negative 2 are also out. So let's get to 3, we do 6, and we get 5, that's 15, that's negative 10, that's negative 30, doesn't work. So let's try negative 3, and we've got negative 6, negative 7, positive 21, negative 4, 12, and 0. So I found my first solution. My first solution is negative 3, um, so I know that that's a factor of x plus 3. And then I'm going to be left here with 
2x squared minus 7x minus 4. Um, and I know that that is factorable. Again, remember, that has to multiply to negative 8, add up to negative 7, so minus 8 plus 1. So 2x squared minus 8x plus x minus 4. And I'm going to group it. 2x, x minus 2, or x minus 4, rather, right? And then plus 1 and x minus 4. So my final factors are 2x plus 1, x minus 4, and of course, x plus 3, which we found at first, okay? And again, if I have to come up with my zeros, I know my zeros are x is negative 3, x is negative 1 half, and x is 4. And if you notice, they're here. There's 3, there's the 3, there's the 4, there's the half. It was obviously they were all in there. It was just a matter of finding them and getting to them. So now, again, I have my zeros. And remember that your zeros, right, they convert, let me just do it, negative 3. I've got negative 1 half, and I have positive 4. And they convert to ordered pairs, negative 3, 0, negative 1 half, 0, and 4, 0. So, again, I come over to the graph. Here's negative 3. Here's negative 1 half, 0. And here's 4, 0. Okay? My y-intercept, that one's super easy to identify as well. Because my y-intercept, if everything is 0, I just am left. If all the x's are 0, then it's the intercept is 0, negative 12. Now, again, this isn't here on my graph. So I'm just going to go up by, let's say, 2's. So... 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and these are negatives. So my y-axis goes by 2's, and I know that it's going to go through here, okay? So I've got some pretty important points there now, okay? I have my zeros, and I have my y-intercepts. If I talk about my multiplicity, I know that everything shows up just once. So my graph is going to go through all of them, okay? Okay, so, or through each one. And then um, zeros, multiplicity, and then I guess n behavior is all we have to talk about. So it starts out with 2x cubed. Since this is odd, my n's go in different directions. And because um, a equals a positive 2, I know that the left goes down and the right goes up. So I have everything I need to graph my graph, okay? Again, I know the left side is going to go down, and I'll clean this up a little bit. I know the right side's going to go up. So I just have to figure out what to do with the middle. Again, because multiplicity, I know it goes through everything. Again, I know I'm going to go through this point. At some point, I'm going to turn around and go down. I'm going to go through this point. I'm going to go to the y-intercept. At some point, it's going to turn back around and come up. And it's going to go towards that, through it, and out the other side. And that's a pretty great, pretty good shading of, or sketching of what the graph should look like. But again, if I really want to make it accurate, I need to maybe find the value, let's say, uh, when x is negative 2. And maybe I can find the value of the graph when x is positive 2. Those might help me get a little bit more precise graph. And so instead of plugging in those numbers in the original equation, I'm going to erase all this that I no longer need. I'm going to use the remainder theorem to find the value of the function. So when x is negative 2, my value of my function is, let's see, negative 5, 10, minus 15, 30, and 18. So when x is negative 2, y is 18. So imagine I had it right here, and it's really super high up. So it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. Imagine 18 is like way up here. Okay, I just need to move it over a little bit. Um, so when x is 2, y is 18. So clearly I came up a little bit short here with this graph right here. I turned too soon. My graph really goes up my angles a little bit off too so let's try that again 
I know that it's going to go up to here, then back down through here. So now I've accounted for a little better this peak. It's much higher than I had initially envisioned, right? And I know this is going to go down. And then the other side, I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to plug in a positive 2, and I'm going to see how that affects my graph as well, right? So what's the value of the function when x is 2? So that's 4, that's 3, that's 6, that's minus 19. Uh, 2 times minus 19 is minus 38, and I've got minus 50. So imagine, when x is 2, my graph drops down all the way to minus 50. So again, I, I definitely have a terrible depiction here of this graph. It goes way lower than I ever expected. So it's going to go super far down. I mean, I'm not even going to do it, but it goes super far down. Okay, so I don't know where, when I hit mute, but basically it's going to go down. At some point at 50, it's going to come, turn back around and come up. Okay, so it's not drawn to scale, but again, it gives you an idea. And it is why we should try these middle numbers, because again, things might be way higher or lower than we're thinking. But this is, again, a great wave. This graph goes off forever, and it's really um, a pretty good depiction. So we're going to just keep doing graphs, and again, you can kind of skip through. Um, I'm going to pause to find the solutions, um, and I'm just going to go straight to the solutions, um, or, you know, finding that first factor, okay? So again here, I know that this is not something I can factor. My possible factors are plus minus 1, my, or my, my factors. My factors of 20 is 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20. And when I'm coming up with my possible roots, remember I have to put the last over the first. And so everything that's in this last one is going to go over 1, which just equals itself. So these are my possible roots. These are going to be my real roots of this function. Um, again, I'm going to need um, to come up with my synthetic division and do my guessing and checking. So in my synthetic division, I've got negative 1x cubed minus 8x squared minus 11x and a plus 20. Um, and so I don't need a placeholder. Everything's there. And um, I'll just basically start with my numbers, right? So I'll start with 1. And again, I'm going to pause until I find the right one. And actually, 1 works. So I didn't have to try too hard or leave too long. So minus 1, minus 1, minus 9. Minus 9, that adds up to minus 20. Minus 20 and 0. So again, I know that 1 is a solution. So um, I have... Um, x equals 1 is going to be one of my solutions, and one of my factors is going to be x minus 1. And my other factor, what's left over here, is going to be a minus 1x squared minus 9x minus 20. And so now I've got to kind of factor this out. Okay, I need to factor this. So I'm going to come over to here, and I'm going to just kind of use this space here to factor this. Okay, because it's going to need a little bit of work. Um, so here I know that to factor, I have to have an A value. I don't want this negative here. So I'm going to kind of pull this negative 1 out. I'm going to have x squared plus 9x plus 20. And I know that this factors to x plus 4 and x plus 5. This x plus 1 here comes down. Or not x plus 1, x minus 1. And this negative 1 is a factor up here. Ultimately, it can be a factor, but it's not going to affect my solutions because I know that I'm going to have um, x equals 1, x equals negative 4, and x equals negative 5. So my intercepts are 1, 0, negative 4, 0, negative 5, 0. So I start there. These are my zeros. These are my intercepts, whatever, 1, 0, negative 4, 0 negative 5, 0. Um, my y-intercept, let me just do that now. Again, if I make everything, e all the x is equal to 0, it's going to be 0, 20. Okay? 
So I'll make these go up by fours. Four, eight, 12, 16, 20. So there's my y-intercept, okay? And then um, I'm ready to kind of, you know, move forward a little bit with like my multiplicity, for example. So in this one, notice again that none of these values are repeated. And so it's gonna go through all points, okay? Or all intercepts, or x-intercepts. And then the last thing we have to think about is um, end behavior. And so end behavior, I know because x is cubed, it's going to go in different directions. But here, the a value is negative 1, which means left up and right down. Positions are going to swap. So again, what does that mean? Well, that means that on the left side, it's going to go up in that direction and on the right side it's going to go down now again I can tweak it and I'm going to I know I go through my point I come back up I go through it I go to my y-intercept I come back down I go through this point and my graph sort of should flow it should look a little nicer than this but so this is just a general wave but that's how it should look something like that now again, um, if I really wanted to be precise, I would have to find, for example, the value of my graph when x is 2. I feel like that might give me just a really better insight into the loop. So again, I'm going to come up, up here and I'm going to plug a 2 in. Or it's a negative 2, right? So I'm going to do negative 1, that's positive 2, minus 6, positive 12, that's going to be 1 negative 2, and that's 18. So believe it or not, I'm very close to where it should have been. So this graph, when x is negative 2, y is 18. So it's actually not far. I actually did pretty good on that one. And again, that's a pretty good judge or, you know, graph or look. Um, you know, this might be another really great spot, like, um, you know, between these two points, this x value here. Um, you know, it's, it's going to get me into fractions. I don't really like fractions, but I could do it. I could do negative four and a half. Negative four and a half is the same as negative nine over two. And I could do the math. Negative nine over two, let's um, bring down the, the negative one. Uh, negative nine over two times negative one is positive nine over two. Um, again, I'd have to kind of change these two over twos, make my life easy. Negative 22 over 2 and negative 40 over 2. I think that would make my life kind of simple. But again, who wants to do that, right? So sort of when it's fractions, I sort of just say skip it. Uh, if you need to do it, we'll do it for the test. You should practice it at home. Good thing you have your calculator and you can do that. But you're, you might not have a calculator for the test. So again, just be able to work with fractions. But again, that's a pretty decent drawing. All right, a couple more problems. We're going to keep going. We've got here, we ask you to graph it again. Now, this is another cubic function. I'm going to keep going. This video is getting long. I'm going to keep going to something other than a cubic function. Not everything is cubic, okay? This one, this one's also cubic. I'm going to keep going. Now this one here is a little bit weird because it's kind of already been given to you in factored form, right? They factored it already for you. So what this is really saying is, is that this function is negative 1 times x minus 3 times x minus 3 times x plus 1 times x plus 1 squared, which is x plus 1 like that, right? So again, they want me to graph it. So I first had to expand it out. And I notice that my solutions are x equals 3, x equals 3, x equals negative 1, x equals negative 1, and x equals negative 1. So my zeros technically are 3 and negative 1, right? Um, or I can think of it as 3, 0, and negative 1, 0, right? So I've got 3, 0 here and negative 1, 0 there. Now, there's multiplicity here. So at x is 3, there's a multiplicity of 2. It shows up 2 times, which means it's going to bounce at 3. And at x equals negative 1, 
right? There's a multiplicity of three, which means it's going to go through the three. Remember, if it's odd, it goes through it. If it's even, it bounces. Um, we're going to talk about n behavior. Again, we've done this before. Um, in this particular case, a equals negative one. This number out here is still your a value, okay? And um, if I notice, I'm going to have an x to the fifth power here because it's x times x times x times x times x when I do the whole thing out. And so I know it's an odd um, um, exponent. And so I know n behavior with odd, they go in different directions, okay? And I know that a being negative one, it's going to go up on the left and down on the right. So my graph is going to end up going up this way and down this way. The middle is what's going to be a little crazy. So again, let's think about the y-intercept. That's one more value I need. Now, if x is 0, I'm going to get a lot of different answers here. This one's not as easy to solve, is it? So when I'm trying to find the y-intercept, I make x equal to 0. So that's going to be negative 3 squared times... 1 squared, or no, just 1, times 1 squared, right? That's it? Okay. So negative 3 squared is 9, and times 1 times 1. So that's going to be 9, and then negative, so negative 9. So when x is, when, when x is 0, y is 9. Is it 9 or negative 9? Negative 9. Okay. So my intercept... Again, let's say 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 is going to be here, negative 9, okay? So my y-intercept is going to be there. And again, now I have to think about my multiplicity. So at negative 1, I'm going to go through it. So we're going to go from up here. We're going to go through it. We're going to go near that y-intercept if we can. We're going to turn back around, and we're going to bounce off of 3 and go back down. We're not going through it to the positive numbers. When we, when we bounce, we stay in the zone we're at. If we're in the negatives, we're staying negative. If we're in the positives, we're staying positive, like above the line or below the line. So that's how this would look without finding those intermediate values, okay? If um, I wanted to be more specific, then, yeah, I might try to find the value of... Um, you know, what is the value of this function when, you know, x is 1, for example. And I could do that. It's just a lot more work. But again, uh, if x is 1, 1 minus 3 is negative 2 squared is 4. Uh, if x is 1, this is going to be 2. If x is 1, this is going to be 2 squared or 4. So it's going to equal minus 32 which means, again, down here, that my graph um, didn't just turn at that y-intercept. In fact, what my graph did was it went through that y-intercept. I'll try to tweak it a little bit now that I kind of know more what it looks like. What my graph did is it went through this, it went to the y-intercept, and it just kept going down, 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 down a little bit. It went, it went pretty far down. So kind of like that. At some point, it turned around, came up, bounced off of it, and went down. And so again, that's a general idea of the graph. Not a pretty general idea. I didn't do a great job there, but again, you get the idea. Everything that's necessary is here. Your x-intercepts are listed, right? Your y-intercept are listed. Your n behavior is highlighted and your bounce or your multiplicity is taken into account. So if you do all that, you've got it. Okay, same goes for this one. This is the same kind of problem. Again, I'm going to have um, a is negative 1. I know that um, x equals negative 2 two times because this is x plus 2 x plus 2, and this is x minus 3, and x, shh, x minus 3. And so I've got negative 2 as a solution twice, and I know that 
um, positive 3 is a solution twice. So it's going to bounce at negative 2, and it's going to bounce at 3. So again, here's 3, here's negative 2. Um, I'm going to find my y-intercept. I'm going to make x equal to 0. Find that number. Um, 0, so that's going to be 2 squared. And it's going to be negative 3 squared. So the opposite of 4 times 9 is going to be negative 36. So imagine that's kind of crazy down there, right? So let's do negative 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36. So here's your intercept. And again, um, my end behavior. So what I'm going to notice is, is that with this, x is going to be to the fourth power. Um, and so x to the fourth power, my end behavior, right, is same direction. Now, the same direction, but a is negative 1, which means both down. So down, down. So my graph is going to go from here, it's going to go down, as is this one, okay? And again, I just have to figure out what's going to happen. Now my, my graph is going to bounce at negative 2, so it's going to stay down here. At some point, it's going to go through the y-intercept. It's going to come back up towards the x-intercept, and it's going to bounce off of it and head down again. And it's going to look something like that. Okay, and lastly, yes, you know, you might want to find out maybe what the value is when it's negative 1 and 1, for example, um, just to be a little bit more specific. But again, we have the general wave. Uh, this is another cubic function. I'm going to keep going. I think that's it. I think we've done a lot. Um, I don't think we need to do... Um, all these problems I think we've done a lot of cubic functions and again when I come here you just you want to be able to look at this look at this and automatically know left down you know right up you know you want to be able to identify the end behavior as soon as you see that leading term okay and then on this one notice it says use the graphing utility to graph that so for here, we're still going to identify the same parts, okay? We're going to be using the graphing utility. We're still going to be identifying our zeros. We're still going to be identifying our y-intercepts, okay? We're still going to do that work. We're still going to kind of identify about the bounces and the multiplicity and all that. So we're still going to be sort of looking at the same thing. We're just going to be identifying it. We're going to be plugging things into the uh, calculator and learning how to use our calculators to uh, do the graphing work for us, and then we're going to learn how to zoom into the calculator to find those values that we might want to find, okay? So we'll get to this in another lesson.